What if church was not just something that happened on Sundays, but an identity that people lived out every day? What if the gospel was more than something we're supposed to believe, but something that was meant to bleed through in every aspect of our lives? What if knowing truth was not the ultimate aim of preaching, but a springboard that's supposed to catapult us into a life of radical obedience? What if there were a people who lived like they really believed that? Myself. My name is Cole Brown. I'm a pastor in Portland, Oregon, and my wife, two kids, and myself drove down here, which I do not recommend to anybody. It is a horribly boring drive, but it's, it's really great to be here with Emmaus. Uh, it's amazing. I've only met a few of you so far, but I just feel incredibly at home here uh, because the church I pastor and this church are so, so similar. Both churches are called Emmaus. Uh, yeah, there's another one. Both churches uh, started as Emmaus in the month of September. Both churches are multi-ethnic, multicultural, gospel center. Both churches are affiliated with the Rebuild Network, and both churches have incredibly handsome pastors. <laughs> so I feel perfectly at home here. Uh, but I have to be honest, actually my wife, we drove in last Sunday. We got into San Jose at about 11.15 we came right here and got to participate in last, last Sunday's uh, worship gathering. And I noticed uh, that I had to step up my beard game. So I, s- I spent a whole week trying to match Jorge, but this is the best I could do. So I apologize. If you have a Bible, would you turn to Colossians chapter 1? If you don't have a Bible, maybe try your smartphone. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is right after the book of Philippians. I'm going to turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 15 there in just a few minutes. As you're turning there, uh, Pastor George did ask me to share one thing with you. I'm going to do it very briefly. Uh, We planted Emmaus eight years ago. It just turned eight years old. We're extremely grateful for that. I thought I would die in the Emmaus pulpit, but God has called me and my family away. So we're actually moving to Costa Rica and the Mexico City to assist in the multiplication and planting of gospel-centered churches. Uh, I'm sharing this with you because we desperately need people to pray for us. So if you are, are pulled in that direction and would like to pray for us, on the back table there, there are magnets with our picture, our email, our content. on. You can grab one uh, and you can just put it there and pray for us as you think of us. Or you can shoot me an email there to the address on the bottom and, and I can put you on our list where you'll receive updates and stuff if that's something that interests you. All prayers are much, 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 much appreciated and needed. So imagine... If you would, let's just use our imagination together. Imagine you're perched atop a towering fence, right? And your your right leg is straddling one side and your left leg is straddling the other. And you don't know how high you are, but you're crazy high because you're looking down and the people who you know are people look like ants. You know you're high and these, these ants as a group start making their way towards your comfortable little fence. And these ants, you know, to stretch out their hands and start to push up against this fence that you're perched upon high, high, high in the ground, in the sky. You scream out to them, stop, someone's up here, stop. But you're too high. Not a soul can hear you. It just disappears into thin air. You start to wobble back and forth. Your heart starts to beat fast. The butterflies start to come. You start running every scenario through your head. You, you try to gain control to make yourself still and rested, but there's nothing you can do. They can't hear you. You're on top. You're stuck. Whatever's going to come is going to come, and you just have to deal with it. Imagine how you would feel in that circumstance. Imagine what would be going through your mind. Imagine what might be happening in your body. See, I think that most of us don't have to imagine that. We know that feeling personally and deeply. We just call it anxiety, right? We, we maybe, hopefully, 
aren't perched atop a towering fence literally, but we feel that same way. Day after day after day. Maybe you're one of the, of the one in five Americans who suffers from anxiety disorder. Well, this is just your perpetual experience is anxiety, 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 anxiety. Or maybe you're one of the other four in five Americans who faces anxiety in this or that circumstance, right? When, when this unexpected thing comes, when this thing falls out of your control, when outcomes are unknown, outcomes are unpredictable, then you know that feeling of being perched atop that fence, having nothing you can do, and feeling like at any moment you could fall straight to the ground. We call that anxiety, and it ain't fun. It doesn't feel Good. And though we all deal with it in different degrees, and though we all deal with it in different ways, we all deal with it at various times. We all know what it's like to be anxious. The good news is, God has a word for us and our anxious hearts. His word for us today from Colossians 1 will be this. When anxiety rises up, and it will rise up, when, when anxiety rises up, don't seek control. Seek Jesus. Because every one of us, we want, we want that control. We want to stop the fence from moving. Don't seek control. That's not the answer. Seek Jesus. And I'm going to make you a promise. A promise based on the text we're about to read. If you will do that, if you will seek Jesus instead of control in the midst of anxiety, you will find rest for your restless heart. I didn't promise that your circumstances will change. I didn't promise that the fence won't totter. I didn't even promise that the fence won't topple. I'm just saying that whether the fence is still or tottering or toppling, if you seek Jesus instead of control, you can have a rest in the midst of utter unrest. And we're going to see how that's possible and why that's so as we look to Colossians 1 this morning. Let's read from Colossians 1, 15 through 20. This is what God writes through his apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit. Speaking of Jesus, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through Jesus to reconcile to himself, to God the Father, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of God of his cross. This is God's word to us this morning. And we're gonna keep our text open if you don't mind. We're gonna continue to return to that and chop it up together over the next three and a half hours or so. I'm kind of long-winded. I'm gonna warn you in advance. God is saying to us through this text today, among many other things, he is saying to us today, when anxiety rises up, and it will, don't seek control, seek Jesus. Why? Firstly, because Jesus is more than enough for knowing God. That's what verse 15 and verse 19 are saying. Verse 15 says, he's the image of the invisible God. Verse 19 says, and all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. He is the image of the invisible God, and all of God's fullness dwells inside this Jesus, this eternal person that we know as God the Son. Now we know... Genesis 126 says everybody in this room is made in God's image, right? It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, if you're young, if you're old. All of us are made by God in God's image. Now, we also know from Genesis 3 that things went a little askew, right? And that that image became stained through our own sin and our own self-worship. But nonetheless, everybody that you interact with in this room, everybody you interact with outside these doors is an image bearer of God, meaning you get to learn something about what God is like by interacting with every person that you have ever or will ever interact with. When someone in your church family forgives you because you said something or did something that hurt them, 
You're experiencing a little taste of who God is in his absolute forgiveness. When someone in the church speaks the truth to you, though it's difficult, you're experiencing a little bit of what God as the truth is like himself. When someone is patient with you or gracious with you or generous to you, they're showing you a bit of who God is and what God is like, who is infinitely generous and infinitely patient and infinitely gentle. We get to know a little bit about who God is from everyday people like us. That's stunning that that God would choose to put himself on display through me, through you, and all of our imperfections that people could come to know things about God from interacting with us. And yet, as magnificent as that is, it is nothing at all compared to who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't show us just a bit of what God is like. Jesus shows us exactly who God is and what God is like. He is not an image bearer of God. He is the image of the invisible God. He doesn't show us some of what God is like. All of God's fullness dwells inside this person in Jesus. Everything you could ever want to know about God is found in Jesus. Anything you could ever know about God is found in Jesus. All of the fullness, the image dwells in this one person. Which means if you want to know who God is, if you're trying to figure out what God is like, if maybe you're seeking to see who God is and what God is like, I'm going to simplify things for you real quick. You only have to look one place. You look to Jesus. Well, where do I find Jesus? You find Jesus in the pages of Scripture. Well, what page? Every page. He's stamped on every page from front to back. That's why your church is called Emmaus. That's why my church is called Emmaus. Because on the road to Emmaus, Jesus said, all of the scriptures testify of me. You want to know who God is? You simply look at Jesus. You want to look at Jesus? You simply open the Bible. Now you and I can give each other hints of what God is like. But we open this book and we see him. I don't care if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you're going to instantaneously see whoever this dude is, he's nothing like any human being I've ever met. You may not yet be convinced he's God, but you're going to be convinced he is utterly unlike what you're accustomed to. He is going to show you who God is. To illustrate what I'm saying, I I want to travel back to the 1990s. Is that okay? Is there anybody here who was alive in the 1990s by a show of hands? Oh, five of you. Wow, you guys look a little old (laughs) compared to what you just told me. In the 1990s, we had these things called fax machines. Anybody familiar with those? It's a machine. It just sounds ludicrous now because we have scanners and email and telephones and everything else. But uh, back then, if I was in Portland and I needed to get a signed document to your pastor here in San Jose, I would go to this little machine and I would put the document in it, and then I would press send, and then out over here, George would pull out another piece of paper that was a representation of the piece of paper I put in. It's not the same piece of paper, but it's a representation of it. Well, if you've ever seen a fax, you know that it's a very loose representation of the original document, right? The original document's that that nice, thick cardstock that you got to pay extra for at Staples, right? And then the thing you hold in your hand on the other side of the fax machine is thinner than any paper you've ever touched in your whole life. It's falling apart in your very hand. You try to read it, but every fax that has ever been sent, the ink is smudged top to bottom, right? You see a word here and then a smudge and then a word there and then a smudge. You think you know what it's getting at, but you're not quite sure what that original document looked like. And then you look at it and you know what the margins of a document should look like, but the margins of the document you're holding in your hand are like this. Every fax ever sent comes out like this. And so you are looking at a representation of the original document that gives you an idea of what the original document was like, but you know it's not exactly what the original document is like. In fact, it's sometimes so different from the original document that the person who sends the document has to attach a cover page explaining to you what in the world you're looking at because you wouldn't be able to know without the cover sheet. That's who we are. We are the facts 
that shows a little bit of what the original document, that would be God, is, is like, but the ink is smudged and the margins are off and the cover letter has to tell us, no, no, you're, you're image bearers, but you're quite stained and the paper is so thin and so unsturdy. That's you and I. Jesus is the original document. He's the exact same thickness as the Father, the same essence. His margins are not off. They are perfect. He reflects who God is with perfection because all of God's fullness dwells in him. There's no smudges on the ink of Jesus. Jesus shines godness from every part without hindrance. He shows who God is and what God is like. Not a, not a facsimile, not a representation, but the very thing. He is the original document. He is God himself, God the Son, God come in human flesh. Okay, what does that have to do with anxiety? Everything. Because what causes anxiety or what increases anxiety? Uncertainty, right? When you're anxious, it's because you're uncertain about what's happening or uncertain about what will happen. But there is one thing that God says right here you can be certain of. You can be certain of who God is Because you can look at Jesus and see exactly who God is. Which means that you can know with certainty as you look at Jesus that God did not create the world and then stand off at a distance and hope you got it right. Right? God isn't watching you in your suffering or watching you in your anxiety going like, I hope they figured out. If they only knew point A and point B, they'd be able to do this. But Oh man, God, somebody be with them. Me be with them, right? God, God is not standing off and watching from a distance. He's not uninvolved in your suffering. He's not uninvolved in your anxiety. Because when you look to Jesus, you see this. You see a God who, yes, was enthroned and then stepped up off his throne and stepped down into his creation. So much so he didn't just come into his creation, but he became his creation, clothing himself in creation's flesh, being born out of creation's womb, being born impoverished, being born hungry, being born thirsty, being born in every way like his creation. So you can look at Jesus, and you can say, I'm uncertain about what's going on, but I'm certain of one thing. God is not far off from me. God is right here with me in the midst of this thing that's causing me such anxiety. You can know that for sure. Now that by itself, for some of you, may be reason to rejoice. For others of you, okay, yeah, God is with me, but who is this God? Well, that's the other thing you get to know when you look at Jesus. You get to know not only as you look at Jesus, is God with you, but God is good, good, good to you. Because this God didn't get off his throne and come to the earth to strike you down, though he had every reason to. He came, got off the throne and came to the earth to be struck down in your place, though he was perfect and sinless, as we just say. This is a God who you have offended for every day of your entire existence, a God who you have sinned against, declared war against, given your heart to lesser gods and less, lesser lovers in his place over and 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 over again. And he says, yes, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Not to judge you, but to be judged so you never have to be judged. Not to pour out the Father's wrath on you, but to absorb the Father's wrath for you so that you never have to taste a drop of it. You look to Jesus and everything else is uncertain. You can be, but I'm certain. You can say, but I'm certain of who God is. Because I look at Jesus, I know that God is with me. I am not alone. And that God loves me and is good to me. You don't have to wonder where God is. You don't have to wonder what God is like. You look at Jesus and you know with certainty who God is. He is the exact representation of the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. All of God's fullness dwells in him. When anxiety rises up, do not seek control. Seek Jesus and he will give rest 
to your restless heart. Why can you do that? Because firstly, Jesus is more than enough for knowing God. Why can you do that? Because secondly, Jesus is more than enough for knowing security. Jesus is more than enough for knowing you're secure. In verses 15 through 17, God reminds us of four things. And each of these four things tells us about the security that is ours in the person of Jesus. Let's just work through them one by one. The first is in verse 15. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. Now when we see that word, we might think from our usage of that word that that means that sometime before Adam, Jesus came into existence, right? That, that Jesus was made. He was the firstborn, the first human being. That's not at all what this means. And one of the reasons we know that's not at all what this means is the very next verse says that God, Jesus created everything that was ever created, right? So he didn't get created. He didn't come into existence. He's the one who brings everything else into existence. So, so what does firstborn mean? It simply means the preeminent one. The one to whom the father's inheritance belongs. In the Old Testament, that was who the firstborn was. It was the one to whom the father's inheritance belonged. The one who was entrusted with all of what belonged to the father. That's what we're seeing here about Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. simply means Jesus is the preeminent one. Everything belongs to him. He is Lord. The second thing we see is that all things were created by him. That's verse 16. For by Jesus, all things were created. Just in case you're not sure what that means by all, he goes on and says things in heaven and things in earth, things you can see and things you can't see, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created by Jesus. Everything. Now that means that when you look around this room, everybody you see here is made by Jesus. It means that when you think of your best friend, and when you think of your worst enemy, they're made by Jesus. It means that when you walk out these doors and you see that blazing sun, you know that blazing sun of all of its glory and all of its heat and all of its burning, it was made by Jesus. And I can tell you from experience, even though that sun is miles and miles and miles away, it gave me a second degree burn this week because my people aren't accustomed to the type of weather you have down here. And I was actually worried I wasn't going to be able to preach because I was was just laid out in so much pain. Uh, The sun can do that from miles and miles and miles away. if, If the sun is that powerful, how much more powerful must the one who made it be? And then you drive west and you you come to the ocean, this grand and vast body of water that is so vast you can't see the end of it and so powerful it can topple you over and suck you under quickly just like that. As powerful and vast as that is, it was made by Jesus, which means the one who made it is more powerful and more vast still. Or you go another direction, you run into these magnificent mountains, these these awe-inspiring mountains that are unmovable. And you know that they were made by Jesus, who is even more unmovable still. To say that everything is made by Jesus means quite literally everything was made by Jesus. It also means that whatever what was made is, Jesus is more so that. He's wiser than the wisest one. He's stronger than the strongest one. He's firmer than the firmest one. He's uh, more faithful than the most faithful one. The creator, rather the creation, is a reflection of the greater wisdom, greater power, greater strength, greater firmness, greater dependability, of the one who made it. And God says, Jesus, Jesus made it all. So he's the firstborn, he's preeminent, he's the maker of everything. Now, all by itself, that would be enough reason for us to fall on our face. But he goes on. He says, not only did he make all things, but he made all things for his own pleasure and purposes. Looking again at verse 16, that last clause says, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus, everything in the entire universe that has ever existed 
anything in the entire universe that will ever exist, exists for Jesus' purposes. That means that the the people in this room, whether you love them or hate them, they exist for Jesus' purposes. Your best friend, your worst enemy, they both exist for Jesus' purposes. That sun that we love to go play in and relax in, that exists for Jesus' purposes. That that ocean we love to go dip our bodies in, that exists for Jesus' purposes. Those mountains we love to hike or climb, those exist for Jesus' purposes. Those beautiful things we love to gaze at, those exist for Jesus' purposes purposes. You (laughs) exist for Jesus' purposes. Everything that exists owes its existence to Jesus, and everything that exists exists for Jesus, for his purpose, for his pleasure, for his plan. That doesn't mean that we can't get pleasure out of all those things, or that Jesus doesn't want us to get pleasure out of all things. That's That's a glorious benefit of being made by him, is that we get to enjoy those things, but they're not ultimately here for us. You're not ultimately here for you. They're all ultimately here to serve the purposes of the one who made them with his purposes in mind. Jesus is more than enough for knowing you're secure. He's the firstborn over everything. He made everything. He made everything for his own purposes. And then lastly, he holds everything he made together. That's verse 17. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So not only does everything owe its initial existence to Jesus, everything owes its continued existence to Jesus. I cannot finish this sentence unless Jesus is choosing to hold me together by his powerful word. You cannot take the next breath you'll take unless Jesus, by his word, chooses to give you that very breath. He holds everything together. Nothing has ever come into existence and nothing can remain into existence apart from Jesus' power, Jesus' will, and Jesus' pleasure. Nothing. He is so magnificent. He is so glorious. There is no word in the English language or any other language to do justice to how amazing this God is. Okay? I feel you, Cole, but can you tell me what any of this has to do with anxiety? I would love to. It has everything to do with anxiety. Because apart from uncertainty, there is another feeling that we hate that leads to or multiplies our anxiety, and that is lack of control. Man, what in the world makes you feel anxious like not having any control over what's happening or what will happen? It's the worst feeling in the world, right? And the truth is you probably don't have any control. And the truth is, that's probably best. The good news is, though you have no control, there is one who has everything in his control. He's the preeminent one who made everything for his purposes, the one by whom nothing can exist apart from him. He holds everything in his good, as we saw, and present, as we saw, control. So, no, maybe you, maybe you don't have the control you wish you had over your finances. That's okay. Jesus controls everything as the preeminent creator and sustainer of all things. Maybe you don't seem to be able to access the control you wish you had over your health, over your body. That's okay. Because there is one who loves you and one who can be trusted, who has power over all things, who most certainly is in control. But Cole, everything around me seems to be out of control. Yes, it seems that way, but everything around you is perfectly in the control of the one who died for you the one who made you, the one who holds you together, just like he holds everything around you together. It is good for you to recognize you're not in control because when you recognize you're not in control, you get to focus on the one who actually is in control and who we know with certainty can be trusted to be in control. We all have this tendency, don't we, to to try to find our security in people or things other than Jesus. Like, and we know it because when it's threatened, that's when our anxiety rises up. So some of you feel anxiety when job security is at risk. Some of you feel anxiety when relationships are at odds. Some, some of you feel anxiety when your bank account uh, has nothing but zeros in it. So, some of you feel anxiety when your health report is bad. There's different causes for all of us, right? But, but whatever makes us feel anxious, that's a sign to us that that's what we're looking to for our security. 
And the problem with any of those things and any other thing is that every one of those things can be overpowered by something more powerful. Why would we look for our security in something that could be overpowered? How many of us would go to a gunfight with a squirt gun? We wouldn't because we know that thing's going to be overpowered, right? Why would we try to find rest and comfort and security in something that's, that's here on the power level and there are 20 things that can knock it right over? But Jesus is the preeminent one. He is the one under whom everything is quite literally his footstool. He reigns and rules over everything. Everything exists by him. Everything exists for him. Everything continues to exist for him. He will never be overthrown. He can never be toppled. He's the only one in whom we have true and actual security because he's the only one who cannot be overcome. Jesus is more than enough for knowing God. Jesus is more than enough for knowing security. And because of that, when anxiety rises up, we are safest when we refuse to seek control and instead seek Jesus. The third thing we see in this text, the third reason that we should seek Jesus instead of control is that he also, in addition to being more than enough for knowing God, in addition to being more than enough for knowing security, Jesus is also more than enough for knowing peace. Look at verse 19 through 20. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Jesus, God the Father would reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we've just seen that Jesus creates all things, right? That's the that's reason to fall on our faces right now. And we've seen that Jesus sustains all things. Oh my goodness, that's reason to give him everything and entrust everything to him. Those things are impressive. Um, But the most shocking of all the things we see is not only that he's a creator, not only that he's a sustainer, but the one who created all things and sustains all things also chooses to redeem all things. And understand, we've given him no good reason to do that. None. From the moment we exited our mother's womb, we have been at war with Jesus. And that's what the rest of chapter 1 describes. Now, you may have never thought of yourself that way, and you would never say, oh, I'm at war with God, I hate God. Some of you would, but, but most of you wouldn't. And yet, that's exactly what we were doing. Because for every second, every second that we were living for someone or something other than him, we were fighting against him. For every instance that we set our affection chiefly on something or someone other than him, we're fighting against him. We're doing the exact opposite of what he intends for his people to do. Every, every single time that we are selfish when we ought to be generous, we're failing to reflect his image. We're waging war against the God who made us to reflect his image. Every moment that we lie when we ought to be truthful, we're doing the same. Every moment that we are bitter, when we ought to be forgiving, we're doing the same. All of these things are constant acts of rebellion against the God who made us and sustains us for his purposes, not our own. Now, given this endless rap sheet of rebellion that we have committed, not only do we dare not go to God, but we couldn't go to God if we wanted to. Let's be honest, we didn't want to. Um, but even if we wanted to, we, we couldn't. So what does he do? He doesn't say, what's wrong with you? Come to me, I'm right here, find me. He says, I'll come to you. Now I would think, uh, if it were me, I would be coming to you, but I'd be coming to you to slap you silly. Let's just be honest. God in Jesus doesn't come to you to be slapped silly. He comes to you to be slapped silly in your place and that's the grandest understatement of all time. Jesus doesn't come to you to say, hey guys, you guys keep getting this thing wrong. Let me show you how this should be done. This is how life should be lived here. No, he comes here and says, I'm gonna live life perfectly for you. Yeah, look, it's a model, but understand I'm I'm not just a model, I'm your substitute. 
I'm obeying perfectly for you. I'm worshiping perfectly for you. My affections are constantly set in the right place on your behalf. My tongue and my speech are pure on your behalf. My thoughts are pure on your behalf. What I set my hands to do is for the glory of God, perfectly without fail on your behalf. The God who has every reason to destroy us chooses to redeem us at the cost of his own son. I worked in retail for many years. Uh, CDs, books, all sorts of things. And you would often get uh, a product that was defective. and A CD that didn't play or a book that had a tear in it. And, And you wouldn't try to fix it. They were beyond repair. You would just toss them in a defect bin And that defect then would end up in the trash or the recycling in a matter of weeks. Jesus made us to reflect his image. We have been eternally defective. He could have and should have, by our standards, tossed us into the defect bin and say, let me start over. These guys ain't got it. But he doesn't. He picks up his creation. And he puts it back together bit by bit by bit, redeeming us, shaping us into the image we were made to bear from the beginning so that we could be like him, so that we could fulfill the purposes for which he made us. He takes us out of the defect bin and makes us his prized possession, sets us up on the mantle and shows everybody, look what I've done. Look what I've done for this sinner. Look what I've taken a dead person and made them alive. Look what I've taken a filthy person and made them clean. Look what I've taken a defective person and make them model and perfect in every way. This is what Jesus does for his people. And how does he do it? Why does he do it? How does he do it? It's right there in verse 20. The last clause, he does it by making peace by the blood of the cross. Now that's hard news to hear that that you're so defective that only the blood of God himself could redeem you. But it's also such wonderful news because it tells you that only the blood of God himself could redeem you. See, this text could have said, by making peace through the blood of his cross and your increased obedience. It could have said, by making peace through the blood of his cross and you coming to church more. It could have said, by making peace through the blood of his cross and you obeying better. It could have said, uh, by making peace through the blood of his cross and you cursing less. It could have said, by making peace through the blood of his cross and you being a more generous servant. By making peace through the blood of his cross and you being more forgiving. It doesn't say any of that. It says, by making peace through the blood of his cross, period. And that's where the peace comes from that you can know that no matter what situation you find yourself in, whether you're obedient or disobedient, faithful or unfaithful, sure of who God is, or finding your faith weak and weak and weak and weak, you can know that you have peace with God because it wasn't purchased and will never be purchased by your obedience. It was purchased by his obedience to death on the cross in your place. I was going to say, somebody better say amen to that. Why is that good news for the anxious? Um, Because for those of us who believe that God exists, um, sometimes those moments of anxiety can feel like God turning his back on us. It can feel like maybe God is punishing us for this, that, or the other that we have or haven't done this day, this week, this month, this year, our lives. And the worst place to be Far worse than being in a place of suffering or a place of anxiety is being in a place of suffering or anxiety and thinking God is against you. That this is God's punishment for you. But you can be 100% certain that that is not the case. If your faith is in Jesus, peace has already been made and it was made through the blood of Jesus' cross, not the blood of your anxiety or your suffering. And so you can know, man, I don't know... I don't know why this is coming. I don't know what is happening, but I know one thing's for sure. God is with me and God is for me. God is not against me. God is not punishing me. He was punished for me, so I would never have to be. This isn't God's punishment. In fact, I know that God is using this for my good, no matter how horrible it may seem. That's the certainty we can have when we know we have peace with the one we declared to be our enemy, and that peace was purchased fully and finally by somebody else, by Christ himself. 
how much of our anxiety is weakened when we know that God is for us in the midst of our disobedience. God is for us in the midst of our obedience. God is for us in the midst of our faith. God is for us in the midst of our doubt. God is for us when we're anxious and the fence seems like it's going to topple. And God is for us when everything seems just perfect. God is for us. Not because we earned it, but because Christ earned it in our place. When anxiety rises up, and it most certainly will rise up, don't do what you're tempted to do, which is seek control to try to make anxiety stop. Seek Jesus. And you will find rest for your restless heart even in the midst of the worst type of unrest. You may be on the fence. And it may be toppling. And you may think, at any second I can fall. But you know who God is. You know you are secure in his hands. And you know that he is not against you. But he is for you. I would like to challenge us to apply this this week in some very specific ways. First, I want to talk specifically to those of you who may be uh, diagnosed with anxiety disorder. I don't want you to hear me saying uh, that if you have a chemical issue, a biological issue, that all you need is to believe this truth and everything's perfect. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying that if you have a biological or chemical issue, remember who made those, your biology. <laughs> remember who sustains you in your biology. And imagine, remember how much... Um, unexpected rest you can have spiritually by resting in him, even if you have diagnosable anxiety disorder. I'm not saying that all of your biological issues go out of the way. I am saying that you will find rest even as your biological issues persist. Secondly, I want to talk to those of you who are Christians that have actively placed your faith in Jesus and worship him as Lord. You might not be anxious today, but you might be tomorrow. It might be in a week, it might be in a year. And here's the thing, I'm not going to be there to preach to you when you get anxious. And that's probably best for you because when I preach, my breath gets hot and stinky. It's true, you'll find out afterwards. And so what do you do when anxiety does come up? Are you going to remember today? Are you going to remember the three points? Probably not. So I would challenge, I would encourage you to memorize Colossians 1, 15 through 20, to spend this week, maybe take a verse a day, just repeat it over and over again until it sinks into your soul. And, and then by the end of the week, you'll find that it just lives in you. And then maybe once a, uh, once a week for the next month, you go over it and you go over it and you go over it. And then when anxiety does come, you may not remember me, you may not remember this sermon, but you can remember that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created visible and invisible on heaven and on earth, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created through him and for him and by him. All things are held together. You can remember that. You can preach the gospel to yourself in that. And as you're sitting atop that toppling fence, you can breathe deep and you can rest in reminding yourself who Jesus is. Thirdly, if you're not a Christian today, we're so glad you're here. If you have not yet firmly placed your faith in Jesus, understand, I'm going to challenge you too. You don't have to do it, but I'm going to ask you to try something. I'm going to ask you, if you've never done it before, to pick up a Bible, and I'm sure we can get you one if you don't have one. I'm going to ask you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are four books we call the Gospels in the New Testament. They're just stories, the story uh, of Jesus' life and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. And I would ask you to do this as you read it, to pray a prayer. Lord, uh, God, if you exist, and if you're anything like what this dude up here was saying you are, would you give me the faith to believe what's written on these pages? I don't want to miss out on rest and life if it's available to me through this Jesus person. On the other hand, Lord, if this dude is lying and everything he's saying is false, will you give me the wisdom to not accept what he says and to instead not put my hope in something that will be false and make me, as Pastor George reminded us last week, to be pitied because I believe something foolish. If you would just ask that and then you would read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, I believe that God will open your eyes to see Jesus for who he is. And maybe you won't finish the books and all of a sudden fall on your knees and worship him as God, though you should. 
but I know that you will see something that you've never seen before. You'll see someone like no one you've ever met before. And you will want it to be true. You will want it to be true because you will see how much rest and how much life is found in this glorious Christ. It is true. And if you will accept the challenge, I believe that God will speak to you and show himself to you. When anxiety rises up, don't seek control. Seek Jesus who is more than enough for knowing God, more than enough for being secure, and more than enough for having peace with the God of the universe. Let's pray.